<laughs> Looking around in our universe, we see air, dirt, grass, snakes, humans, water, whales, cats, insects, trees, stars, the list goes on and on. You might assume an infinite number of ways that matter can take shape. Then you might imagine an infinite number of elemental building blocks that build up that matter. Negative. What if I told you there are only about a hundred different kinds of elements made of fundamental particles called atoms? Back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, a scientific revolution in Europe led us to our current belief in the modern atomic theory. What experiments did these scientists do that would lead us to understand this invisible world? Who were these people and how did they assemble the atomic theory around these impossibly small particles that can't be seen even with microscopes? Around 440 to 430 BC, the Greeks Leucippus and his more recognized student Democritus started this whole thing with their theory of atomism, that everything is composed of atoms, which are unbreakable, constantly in motion, and infinite in number and types. Democritus said that nothing could come from nothing, that everything is already in the world and it's merely a matter of combination and recombination of atoms. This is pretty much what we believe now, but he also thought that the behavior of any given material was dependent upon the shapes of these atomic bits. This and the belief that there are an infinite number of types is the only difference in today's understanding of atomic structure. So they almost had it right, thousands of years before any scientific proof. Before the 1800s, many of the early atomic scientists thought that atoms and molecules existed. For example, it explained why some things that mixed would not give equal volumes, yet still give equal masses. Boltzmann thought of gas molecules as colliding billiard balls in a box. He noticed that with each collision the molecules would become increasingly disordered. Boltzmann explained how steam engines worked, why hot goes to cold but not the other way around, by imagining tiny atoms randomly moving always towards disorder. Many of his contemporaries disagreed on grounds that there wasn't yet proof that atoms even existed. But his equations were so compelling that most everyone agreed with his proofs on thermodynamics. Thus, circumstantial evidence for the existence of atoms. In 1827, Robert Brown was looking at pollen grains in water through a microscope. He noticed the particles move through the water with a vibration like bees in a hive. Albert Einstein published a paper in 1905 that explained in detail how the motion Brown had observed was a result of the pollen being moved by individual water molecules. This explanation of Brownian motion confirmed that atoms and molecules actually existed. According to Einstein, they're one ten millionth of a millimeter. In 1897, Thompson showed that cathode rays were composed of negatively charged particles. 2,000 times smaller than hydrogen atoms. He called these corpuscles, later to be called electrons. He estimated the mass of cathode rays by measuring the heat generated when the rays hit a thermal junction and compared this with the magnetic deflection of the rays. By comparing the deflection of a beam of cathode rays by electric and magnetic fields, he found the charge and the mass of the electron. This is the first discovery of a subatomic particle. In 1909, Rutherford carried out the gold foil experiment, which demonstrated the nuclear nature of atoms. Rutherford asked Geiger and Marsden in this experiment to look at the deflection of alpha particles. Rutherford's interpretation of this data led him to formulate the Rutherford model of the atom in 1911, that a very small charged nucleus containing much of the atom's mass was orbited by low mass electrons. He used a beam of alpha particles generated by the radioactive decay of radium, directed onto a sheet of very thin gold foil in an evacuated chamber. A zinc sulfide screen at the focus of a microscope was used as a detector. The screen in the microscope could be swiveled around the foil to observe particles deflected at any given angle. This experiment disproved Thompson's plum pudding model because of an uneven amount of alpha particles that passed through undeflected compared to those that were deflected. 
Roughly 10,000 particles would pass through the foil before one would deflect backwards. This meant the nucleus must be positive, and that it was almost 10,000 times smaller than the whole atom. Later, Rutherford theorized about the existence of neutrons in 1920, which could somehow compensate for the repelling effect of the positive charges of protons by causing an attractive nuclear force and thus keep the nuclei from flying apart from the repulsion between protons. Rutherford's theory of neutrons was proved in 1932 by his associate James Chadwick, who recognized neutrons in bombarding beryllium with alpha particles. In 1930, Walter Botu and his student Herbert Becker discovered that when beryllium is bombarded by alpha particles, it emits a very energetic stream of radiation. They first thought this stream was gamma radiation because, like gamma rays, they were extremely penetrating, but they wouldn't deflect through a magnetic field, so they must be neutral. In 1932, Chadwick proposed that this mystery particle was Rutherford's neutron. He made a simple apparatus of a cylinder containing a polonium source and a beryllium target that he based on an experiment that was first done by Irene Curie and her husband. This radiation was directed at paraffin wax rich in carbon. The carbon protons were displaced or pushed out and detected by a Geiger counter. Chadwick was able to calculate their velocity and with simple math calculated their mass. Mass times velocity before a collision equals mass times velocity after a collision, or Newton's third law of motion. He found the mass of the neutral radiation was almost exactly the same as protons, so this experiment proved neutrons weigh the same as protons. Unfortunately, there was a big problem plaguing the scientific community at the time. Rutherford and his colleagues were noticing that the charge didn't equal the weight of the atoms. So, for example, hydrogen, one proton, weighed one, no problem there. However, helium with two protons weighed four. How could something that has two protons weigh four? So they realized later that neutrons were making that extra weight. So this would be a weight of four. Helium is a weight of four. Then oxygen, with the atomic number of eight, or the charge of eight, had a weight of 16. This meant to scientists that there were only three components of all atoms in the entire universe. Electrons, protons, and neutrons. But how do you weigh the mass of atoms? Since air is made of atoms, you can't put atoms on a scale and measure how much the scale responds because it's already being pushed by atoms. And you can't even see them to accurately select how many you placed on a scale. So, weighing them just doesn't work. Well. <laughs> to measure atomic masses, we use a mass spectrometer. Yay. The original sample, they first did it with gases, is electrocuted, so the electrons from the sample are stripped off and the atoms are now positively ionized. They flow down the chamber by being drawn towards a negatively charged cathode and push away from a positive anode plate behind the atom source. Then, powerful magnets will bend the rays away from their straight path. The more massive the nucleus of the atom sent down the path, the less the nuclei will veer from their straight path. It's like trying to push a train sideways while moving at high speeds, compared to pushing over a small bicycle. So the less massive ones, like hydrogen, that would be the bicycle, are easy to push off the straighter path by the strong magnets. That leaves the scientists to compare the amount of change from the straight path as a ratio of mass versus electric charge. So atoms are not weighed, they're just compared as a ratio of how much they stray from the path of hydrogen 1 and carbon 12. In 1898, William Wien, while working as an assistant to Hermann Himholtz in Berlin, was inspired by Thompson's work on cathode rays and began comparing cathode and canal rays. Using powerful electromagnets, he found that the canal rays deflected in a direction opposite the cathode rays, so they carried a positive charge of electricity. He called these positive rays. Thompson decided to work with Wien's apparatus, except that he allowed positive rays to hit a zinc sulfide screen at the end of the tube. It would fluoresce when hit with rays. 
This enabled the deflections caused by the electrical and magnetic fields to be recorded more accurately. Later, photographic films were used to create a permanent record for these experiments. In 1913, while exploring canal rays, J.J. Thompson channeled a stream of ionized neon through his mass spectrometer and measured its deflection by placing a photographic plate in its path. Thompson observed two small patches of light almost joining to make a fatter blob of light and decided that the neon gas was composed of atoms of two different atomic masses, neon 20 and neon 22. So the idea that atoms could exist as more than one species, or isotopes, was proven. Soon they realized that atoms having more or less neutrons must be causing the difference in this mass. This is how we weigh atoms. Uh.